All right, today is April 25th. This is the KCP community meeting. And um, I think if y'all were out at KubeCon and or couldn't make last week's meeting, uh, we did talk about how uh, we are looking for new maintainers for the project. Uh, let me share the note that I posted um, last week. So basically, uh, I'll echo what's in here. Uh, we still firmly believe in Kubernetes, the ecosystem, obviously OpenShift, uh, and the community uh, that is part of KCP, Kubernetes, OpenShift, and the broader CNCF. It's an amazing group of people. And uh, we've had to do some difficult inward looking and just try to reevaluate what we can commit to and work on upstream. And, um, you know, unfortunately for, for those of us who have been maintaining KCP and working at Red Hat, um, you know, we're being shifted to other things because KCP is less of a priority for, for Red Hat in terms of what we can deliver for maximum impact and benefit for our customers and products. So um, having said that, uh, we, we love the open source community and we love that y'all have been interested in KCP for the past uh, couple of years. So essentially we are looking for new maintainers. So if anybody is interested in uh, taking over and uh, you know wants to continue on with KCP and the awesome stuff that we have here, please reach out to me, Paul Weil, Stefan Schmansky. Uh, we are available to help with the transition and you know, would love if anybody has the time and capacity to take on that role. So, that's all I've got for today. I'm happy to answer questions uh, or continue this discussion. So if there's any uh, thoughts or comments or questions, please let me know. Mike. Yeah, let me just add that for the Edge MC work, also called KCP Edge, um, we are still retain uh, management support and are committed in continuing to develop this. Um, we will deal with whatever uh, happens with the remainder of KCP. Uh, you know, we're still working out the plan. And as part of that, in fact, in this uh, forum here, I have some questions I'd like to explore. Um, we do find KCP core useful. Uh, do not have the um, manpower available to maintain it by ourselves. If there were a remaining community of people who found KCP core useful or some a fragment of it, we might be able to join with that community to maintain it. Um, but we also do believe that we need uh, an independence from KCP um, for the edge work, for those of you who have been following it. Um, our dependence on KCP has mainly been on um, being embedded in a context that has multiple logical clusters. And we use these logical clusters for a few things. They're very useful. Um, but the, the, the edge MC use of the concept is not very detailed. Uh, we could work with anything that supplies things that act like Kube API servers and the associated controllers. Um, so the, the thinking is to uh, develop an abstraction that, um, like Vince did for controller runtime, but you know for more general use, so that we can work with a variety of providers for what we need. Um, so anyway, so I'm, so question for this audience. You know, are, is, are others, so I guess my point was, I'm trying to illustrate how little of KCP core we need. We need something, we, we don't even need, but we would like something that provides in a relatively efficient way, this multiplicity of logical clusters, uh, as you call them here. Um, if there are other people in this community who would be interested and able to contribute to maintaining that level of functionality, you know, we might be able to join together to do, accomplish something. Also, uh, as was outlined earlier here in the discussions of upstreaming the KCP work, right, one thing that was agreed on with upstream is that it would be useful to upstream the generic control plane work. Um, 
I want to, so I want to ask about the the possible future of that. Um, I think I do think that that would be useful for the com the case Kubernetes community as a whole uh, for the reasons that that have been discussed before. Um, also, I do think the uh, idea of um, you know virtualizing the server, uh, as you guys call it here, logical clusters uh, upstream, they call it super namespaces, you know whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it has general utility if it's not oversold as multi-tenancy. If we think of it only as adding a higher level of namespacing, um, I think a case could maybe be made, um, and that's a separate track. I think I want to pursue that or think of that as a separate track. Um, the the you know, as we discussed last week, right? We need to gather use cases and and make the case. So I, I do want to do that. Um, and finally, for KCP itself, last I talked to you, Andy, the rebase on the 1.26 was almost done. Um, it would be great if that is or could be finished and then a new release cut so that we can, you know, at least for a while, the, the, the we're going to continue to use KCP as it is. Uh, it would be great if, as it is, we're uh, v0.12 using Kubernetes 1.26. So I wanted to ask about that. Um, yeah, I have all the unit tests passing, everything lints okay. Uh, I have one issue I've got to figure out what's going on where something in resource quota is closing an already closed channel and the server panics. Uh, I think I had some flakes with some of the uh, webhook EEs, but I'm chasing that stuff down at the moment. Uh, you know, everything else is essentially done, um, pending figuring out what where the bugs are. Great. Oh, and I forgot one other thing. Um, and it's not so much ask for the community. I just need someone, perhaps Andy, perhaps one other person. Um, as you know, we talked about with months ago with Stefan, we agreed that part of the solution to our problem will be to create a new kind of view that uh, denatures objects, certain kinds of objects that that uh, KCP is still giving an interpretation to. Um, we started, you and I started talking about that last week. We need to actually finish that conversation with someone and get that view built. I think we could spend some time now since we're here and that doesn't require us to set up another meeting. All right, but let's get the other things out of the way. Yeah. Are there other people here who are interested in, you know, the essential part of KCP core, which is the logic clusters? Yes. Surprise. Yes, we are. Uh, we are exactly needing what you just described, basically the logical cluster feature and not much edge, not much edge of KCP. So we would also be very interested in keeping that part alive. Okay. Um, wait, wait, just let me give uh, yeah, go ahead. time. Let's see if there's anybody, is there anybody else here? So okay, MJ so says one other yes, in chat. but mm -hmm. depends on what sort of time he'll be allowed at work. Yes, Christoph, what do you what what do you how much manpower can you guys contribute? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure actually. So far, we've been only users of KCP, and we have admired the development work from afar. Uh, we haven't really delved into the, the depth of KCP. And I can't speak for my project lead, so I can't tell you how much manpower we could um, input, unfortunately. We are a bit surprised by the decision last week that KCP was kind of uh, getting less of a focus at Red Hat. And so we are a little bit scrambling and seeing what we can do now. We haven't really made up our minds yet in terms of manpower. OK. Now, the complicating factor here is that is the, the API export and API binding. Uh, there is the external kube bind, which does not um, have any entanglement with the logical clusters in KCP and could be used, but uh, has been pointed out here repeatedly, uh, the version in KCP is much more efficient precisely because it is entangled with the logical clusters in KCP. So this begs a question. Um, so let me ask you and uh, MJ, you know, are you interested in Kube APR export and binding as well as logical clusters? Yes. So far, we're at least using this in our uh, proof of concept. 
So I guess we need this to continue to work. And that, that impacts on the magnitude of the work and, and the magnitude of what's being maintained. So we're talking about logical clusters and the KCP variant of API export and binding. MJ, what, what do you guys have to say about that? Yeah, I think API export is not that big of the deal for us. We could we could work that on a higher level basically by just distributing the API bindings as in a I would say old school way by interacting with multiple virtual clusters. Like I understand the complexities it brings because it's the most complicated piece of code in the code base currently. And I personally think that if we remove that split out now, we have a chance to keep maintaining it, where if it stays, it might be a bit overkill. Well, yes, you're getting to the point that I wanted to ask Andy and the other people who have been doing the maintaining, right? This is a really the sizing question. Um, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, how much work are we talking about if someone were to take on, if some you know, remaining community were to take on maintaining. And of course, the important question then, are we talking about maintaining only logical clusters? We're talking about maintaining logical clusters plus API export and binding. So I think, let me ask, put this to Andy and anybody else who knows, I guess there's really two questions, right? How much work would be involved in maintaining only the logical clusters? And how much work would be involved in maintaining logical clusters plus API export and binding? So, I think logical clusters has more effect across a broader part of the code base potentially, but I think it's oh, easier yeah, I would to expect, maintain. Right, it's, it's pretty pervasive. Well, but I think it's easier to maintain than the um, API exports and bindings bit. I think that uh there were a lot of things that we ran into with uh partial metadata cross cluster lists and watches that uh i understand the intricacies now but when i was first writing it there were gaps in my understanding that only showed up after really digging in and trying to figure out why some random E to E test failed once in a blue moon. Um, so I, I think the maintenance burden for logical clusters is lower, even if it means like it's more mechanical, like you've got some function signature where in KCP's fork of Kubernetes, we've added a parameter or two. And so that has a ripple effect, obviously, when the function signature changes, you've got to go change all the call sites. But then upstream diverges and adds some other field to the function signature. So you just have to deal with conflicts. And that's not like that's mechanical. It's like, oh, here's what upstream did. Here's what KCP did. Let's go reconcile the two. It's not that bad from an effort perspective. Whereas um, just the, I think the API export and binding is uh, just technically more challenging to make sure you don't mess something up uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. Could you be quantitative? Let's start with the simpler one then, uh, just maintaining logical clusters. Um, I mean, if we're talking about maintenance, is this merely a matter of uh, you know rebasing every time on every Kubernetes release, or is there more work that we're talking about? Well, it, it, at a bare minimum, yes. Right. Uh, so let's start by quantifying that. Um, can you give us an es estimate, in, like in terms of man hours or something like that? The well, work. So for for the one twenty six rebase, uh, I would say from start to having KCP start function, like have the the server come up and be ready, uh, it's probably about a week of my time. Uh, but where things get a little bit harder to quantify is you never know, like, was there a new controller that was added upstream that we now have to 
make it logical cluster aware because it's a new critical component in a new Kubernetes version. Right. So, so for the, example, uh, API priority and fairness, we had planned, you know, a while ago to, to, to put in, uh, you know, we had a guy put it in and then the, the design was rejected and right now it's not there at all. So um, that's, you know, an example of, in some sense, a control that's, that's not, still not logical. I, I, think a, I think a better example is like the, I mean, that is, that is a good example of, of things that need to be KCPified. Uh, so not to discount the importance there, but uh, the CEL based admission or validating policy. Right. Another, a new feature. Yeah, right. So that one came in. Uh, I had to undo some changes that we had done in KCP that made it harder to, <laughs> to pull that in. Uh, but that one, because of some of the foundation work that we already have, wasn't too bad to add. I'd be happy to show what that looks like, and then we can try and quantify that. Um, I don't know that I can give you any hard and fast numbers or time. Right. You can't predict, right? Because it depends on the changes that come down the pike, which you never know what that's going to be. Yeah. Um, let me also follow up on a week of your time. Uh, if someone, if I were to tell someone something took a week of my time, that would be ambiguous because it, do you mean like a calendar week or a week yes. of working outside of meetings, right? Because my time is highly diluted by meetings. Um, so when you say a week of your time, is that a, a you know like 40 hours of coding or is that like 20 hours of coding interrupted by 20 hours of meeting? Uh, it was definitely a calendar week and there were meetings that I was not spending time working on the rebase. Um, so probably somewhere between 20 and 30. All right, thank you. Okay. But uh, also, I, I not necessarily to, to toot my own horn like i've done this before and yeah that's uh, worth understanding and noting right someone yeah. else to pick it up there would be a learning curve yeah right okay so let me also go let's let's go on to the other topics now so the, the generic control plane um is there you know what, what is can you give us some idea does red hat still think that that's a, something that they would be willing to spend time on um from what I recall, the direction that we were given was we can be advisory on that, uh, but not lead the effort. So like if folks on this call write a cap, we can comment on the cap. So I noticed a, uh, you know, a while ago that, that there was already a generic control plane uh, directory, if I recall, or package in KCP, but lately it seems to have disappeared. No, can you tell me? There. Okay. That, can you tell me what's our... the current? I was just going to ask. You know, what's the current state? How much work remains to be done to upstream it? So the origin of that package is we take the Cube API server code uh, and copy bits and pieces of it into this brand new generic control plane package. And then we go turn off things or don't carry forward things that we don't want to have in the generic control plane. So anything around uh, the Kubernetes service and trying to deal with services and endpoints um, that doesn't carry forward. So I think, uh, I think we talked about this last week that SIG API machinery is more interested in having people start from nothing and propose what a generic control plane library would look like versus starting with the Cube API server and trying to strip pieces of it out. The end result may be identical or very close to it, but uh, that, that's just the direction that they've given. Well, what I heard last week was a little bit different, which was a development plan, which was to uh, first develop the generic control plane. I, I mentioned this would be a repo, um, like that would be built on top of API server. Um, and once it was sufficiently developed, then the Kube API server could be modified to be built on the generic control plane rather than built directly on API server. Yes, although I would imagine it would probably be a staging repo in Kubernetes. 
yeah. right right just like api server is a staging <laughs> yeah. repo right right it gets published as a separate repo but it's under the staging uh, directory right right so so i heard what i heard was a development plan uh get the generic control plane functional and then cut over the AP, the kube api server to use it yeah. and of course that makes sense you don't want to you know destabilize the thing you've got you know you want to make a move only when you can actually have a functional move um so that that makes perfect sense um but it also makes sense to me if that's the plan then i would what i would propose for the generic control plane is exactly a subset of the kube api server right because i would be looking forward to the day when the kube api server becomes an addition to it a build on top of it I don't disagree with you. Um, you might want to chat with David Eads um, from SIG API Machinery. He he might be able to articulate his expectations better than uh, me trying to play telephone. I All I recall from the conversation is don't start with Cube API Server and strip things out. Start with nothing, develop a generic control plane library, and then cut over. All right, then. Uh, I will go talk to David about that. Um, I'll try to put that. Oh gosh, I think there's an API machine. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get that on an API machinery SIG meeting as, agenda as soon as possible then. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple logistical things in terms of like CI. Um, I know we talked about this last week, but we have some of our stuff in GitHub Actions, some of it's in the OpenShift Prow instance. And I think for the time being, it's OK to keep having stuff in the OpenShift Prow instance to keep the lights on. Uh, there are some limitations. You have to be in the OpenShift group, or sorry, the OpenShift um, GitHub organization to approve, uh, or you have to be a member of that org so that you can slash approve PRs. And I believe only Red Hat employees can be in that GitHub org. So, um, you know, we'll be happy to continue and review and approve things that uh, edit CI for KCP until hopefully there's some transition to an, a different system. But it's not something that we're just going to turn off immediately. Good. Thank you. Andy, go ahead. You're muted. Yeah, too. got it. So <clears throat> just wanted to let everybody know that we're going to continue the discussion on the KCP Edge community calls as well, you know, about how we're going to uh, manage the dependencies here. So I'll drop a note in the chat here if anybody's looking to join us to continue the conversation there. And I would say, like, once we have folks who are interested in um, carrying forward with KCP, we can get you added to the org if you're not already in it. We can get you added as um, in the owner's file as approvers, make sure that you have all the appropriate permissions in GitHub and uh, certainly talk through any logistics in terms of how uh, repo maintenance is done releases and whatnot like we, we try and have as much stuff documented as possible i know mj asked for a rebase doc which i still have on my to-do list but i think really the only um the only thing where people might struggle a bit is just what i was talking about with prowl and getting the prs approved but we'll we'll be around for helping with that okay so hey, um, um Question for you, uh, Andy. You said you had something about how you're managing or putting together releases. I'd be interested in seeing. There's a doc um, in the website and in the, the repo for it. Okay. Um, the only thing that I think I sometimes vary from what's written in the doc is editing the change log in the release notes that uh, sometimes I will actually most of the time i'll go in and like delete things that are just you know not things that need to be announced in uh, in a change log like oh we cleaned up this code you know, stuff like that but everything else um I pretty much follow to the letter okay publishing a new kcp release mm -hmm. yeah
Anything else, anybody? As people on the call, you mentioned that generic uh, API server code base in the KCP itself repository. Do you know from top of your head which? It's in the Kubernetes fork. Ah, that's why. So it's in KCP dev, Kubernetes, package, generic control plane. Cool. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, and that, like I said, that's basically a copy from a couple different packages related to the Cube API server, consolidating them into one and removing things that are Cube specific or really more compute specific. So anything that deals with pods, services, webhooks tends to have been uh, removed from there. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I suspect anybody who will try to rebase it first time, to like one to seven, will have more questions because at this point it's hard to know what you don't know. Yeah, the hardest part about the rebase is that because it's a separate package, if there was new code that was added in the originating locations, you have to identify what changed in between those you know two versions and then decide do i need to carry this forward into the generic control plane package fortunately it, you know you do a git diff on a couple of packages upstream between like 126 and 127 and it should be fairly evident uh, what the changes were Yeah, cool. I think if you at some point get that like bullet pointy list in which order you did that stuff, that would be appreciated. I suspect if I had time, I might just start playing around just the very base process itself, just yeah. to understand the scope basically while people are still around. So it doesn't mean we need to replace it now, but I think earlier we start poke around, earlier we understand. Yeah, well, I mean, as soon as, um, we get the 126 rebase done, you could always go up to 127, you know? And I mean, I'd be willing to spend some time with you or whoever ends up doing the next rebase. Yeah, I think let's, I would like people to still like negotiate more understand how different parties, how much time we can involve. I know I need to do that with my new employers yeah. too. And to see if, if if that can be scoped officially, not from the under the hood IT services basically. All right. Um so we wrap up for now and uh i probably well actually i will be unavailable uh next week so i can't make the community meeting uh we may try and have somebody else from the team cover but um we are most likely uh i would say beyond either this week or next week uh going to need someone else to take over the community meetings um uh, if you know if folks want to keep going oh and that's one other thing i need if if somebody does decide to continue the ksp community meetings i need to uh transition the it's a separate youtube google account for the ksp community youtube uh it's not a channel but whatever it's called um or i guess it is a channel so that'll be something else that will transition. Yeah, that's a good point. Under which organization currently the meeting invite sits? Uh, I believe I created it, but it was sent to the KCV dev Google group. So what 
Is that as long as affiliated have... with anybody, like organization wise? Uh, well, I mean, it's affiliated with me, but what? So we had a problem when Jason left uh, Red Hat whenever he left last year, where we were having trouble with the the YouTube account and the Google Meet that was set up for it. So what I did to fix it is you go into the event in, in the calendar and you remove the Google Meet that's associated with it. And then I had to save the changes without sending any notifications. Once those changes were saved, that the old Google Meet was deleted. And then I edited the meeting a second time and I added a Google Meet and that was a, that linked it to my Google account and then we were able to continue. So we can do the same thing. Like I, assuming I'm able to, I can edit the invite, remove the Google Meet, and then somebody else could come in and add their own or switch to Zoom or something else. Yeah. I'm asking because I saw the Gmail radio.com SIP IDs in the invite. Yeah, I mean, I think if I go in here, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we need to solve it now. I think first of all, we need to understand how we're going to take this forward. Like, do we establish some some new governance board or some other organization tries to lead it? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm not sure, like looking at this, because we they made some changes in our G Suite where like, every meeting has a google meet by default i don't know if i can delete this i'll figure it out separately yeah cool let's okay. follow up on mj's comment about governance right this is this a cncf sandbox or is this completely independent no kcp is independent right so do we have any formal governance no uh i mean our governance is those of us who are in charge are in charge and uh i know there uh, there were requests through some back channels for more official governance. Um, so given that uh, we need to transition this to new maintainers, uh, whoever takes over can decide where to take it from here and, and what sort of governance to put in place. Um, hopefully you all think that we've been really nice from a governance perspective. Uh, and I would hope whoever carries this forward would um, you know, continue to have the same values and whatnot, uh, be it independent with the CNCF or some other foundation. Uh, but short answer, there's no formal governance in place right now. All right, well, uh, if you all find out that you're able to commit any amount of time to maintaining KCP, I would be thrilled. Please let me know. And um, you know, whoever is interested in getting approval rights on the repos and whatnot, uh, just let me know. Mike, go ahead. Right. So also, as we talked earlier, I do want to talk about um, creating that denaturing oh, view. Right. Let's do uh, that. We don't. We don't need. I mean, yeah. So, uh, oh, and Stefan's here. That's great because it was his idea in the first place. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I'm I'm ready to geek out. If you could like show me the the main of a view and help me understand how to build the view we're talking about, um, that would be great. So, we, I think we need to step back a little bit. So, Stefan, for context, we're talking about the the denaturing or inert objects that they're interested in doing. I am skeptical to be honest that it would be achievable uh at least in the current way that kubernetes works so like you were talking about i think creating rbac objects or deployments or whatever right that live in a, a workspace somewhere but they're they, nothing happens to them so yeah the idea is um with you know generally speaking what we're doing one of the things we're doing with, with um workspaces in edge and c is we're using some of them as just containers yeah. uh, whereas some other multi-cluster management projects define a container object we use a workspace as a container so we need the objects to all be inert 
uh, you know, and the attractive thing about KCP workspaces is they already make a lot of coop things inert, but they still give interpretations to some things like service accounts and RBAC. And so we want to be able to give a view to typically what you think of as left shifted clients, yeah. things that are, you know, delivering from a pipeline into what they think is an API server, we want to deliver into one of these containers uh, and have the container only contain. Uh, so we want to denature the service accounts, the RBAC, all the stuff that uh, even KCP gives an interpretation to today. So my thought was that the, the most obvious way to do it would be to uh, translate the API group. You know, when, when you've got an API group x.y.z, you know, translate it into x.y.z.denatured. Uh, uh, okay. So you're basically accepting as input the normal API group, right? but you want to translate it and store it as something different. Yeah. And there's a fixed set of these types, right? Because KCP interprets only a fixed set of, of uh, resources. So we would define you know, a few of these denatured API groups that have the, the needed resources that need to be denatured um, and so what the view does is to its client, you know, they, they look like they, they appear under their normal group. And then when it comes time to store them in the underlying server, they're stored in the denatured groups. Yeah, let me pull something up. Hold on. So there's certainly something about order, right? The requests are processed by the internal types first, I guess. Is this the case? So you you must be in front of the whole chain. I'm sorry, maybe I'm uh, misinformed. I thought a view was implemented by a logically um, independent server. It's basically like a proxy, right? It's just between the client of the view and a regular server. So, um, Mike, you want to translate into the the logical types in the view, right? But in the normal workspace, there are I know, denatured groups. Is this correct? I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, terminology. I'm not quite sure I follow your terminology. So let's see if we can uh, agree on some terminology, right? Um, I, I think of this as typically useful in a situation where there's a pipeline right off to the left that thinks it's delivering stuff into a regular API server. Um, and so it's the client of the view. Um, and so the view is logically a proxy that sits between the clients that think they're using regular Kube API server and a KCP workspace um, where I want to store these modified, you know, inert versions of the objects so that KCP does not interpret them as it normally would. That's what right, I mean. So maybe yeah. call that the underlying server, right? So we've got a, yeah. the, 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 the view is a proxy that sits between a client and an underlying server. Does that make sense as terminology? Yeah. So when the client talks about, for example, an RBAC object, you know, in group, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, that, that Kubernetes.io, in the underlying server, this thing would be stored in something dot Kubernetes.io dot denatured. Yeah, you could do something like that. Uh, so you would need to get those API types registered. Yes. Um, and that's why I was saying there's a few fixed ones of them, right? So we would use the CRD puller to yeah. uh, get their definitions into CRDs, just modify the API group in the CRDs, and now we've got them defined. Some details, owner references and other API machinery references. They Owner reference, reference. To, they reference what like the the logical names, the group names, or the denatured ones. Um, what I what think do you expect? Figure that out. I think. You know, so my going in position is, you know, our, the goal here is to make a container that only stores. So, um, what happens? So, so. Uh, supposing the loan references are not modified. Uh, so that means that the garbage collector on operating on the underlying storage does not see the owner references. 
Um, yeah, do we not see them? If we just you're right, but they won't be effective. They won't. They won't hook up. They won't connect like normal. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's actually a, a problem deeper in the edge system, right? Because we're trying to build. This is for multicast. So if you multicast owner references, um, you know, if you want them to be, to be effective, once you multicast them to the edge clusters. Uh, they have to be translated because the owner reference has a UID of the, the owning object. Um, so I think maybe my going in position is that in the edge MC scenario, maybe there aren't owner references in the workload prescription, right? I mean, if you keep, because there, for example, you know, our friend, the deployment object, right? There, there are owner references from the replica sets and the pods back to the deployment. But in the workload description, the, the replica sets and the pods don't exist, so we don't need to worry about their owner references. Yeah, I, I would recognize that you may have some issues with owner references and maybe put that, like, write that down as a to-do, because um, mm -hmm. it, it is a very valid concern that Stefan brings up. But uh, Yes, if there really needed to be owner references in the workload you know, prescriptions, um, then we have an issue not only in denaturing, but in multicasting to the edge clusters. So yes, I agree. Uh, let's suppose for the moment that the workload prescriptions don't need owner references. Yeah, so um, given that we don't have a ton of time, I'm gonna try and get through a little bit of this fairly quickly. Okay. Uh, so I'm inside of, uh, package and then I go down to virtual and I'm in initializing workspaces and I'm in builder build.go. The reason that I picked this one and not either the API export virtual workspace or some of the TMC sinker bits is that this one does it a little bit differently in that it returns a raw HTTP handler where you can do stuff. And this may be uh, appropriate for you or maybe not, but this seemed like a pretty good starting place so um, I know, Mike, you and I talked one-on-one -on -one the other day about how we have these named virtual workspaces and we have some dynamic virtual workspaces. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of that stuff. You'll see that if we go to the bottom of this builder, uh, it returns this slice of three different named virtual workspaces. Um, Without going into details about why there's a slice, the one that I'm interested in looking at is the one that returns an HTTP handler. And so that one, uh, this one is right here. It's this workspace content. It returns a handler virtual workspace, which in addition to having this, the three bits that are in the dynamic one, it is a handler factory that says, given the root API server's completed config, give me back an HTTP handler that serves content. So if we look at this one, you'll see there is a root path resolver, there's an authorizer and a ready checker, and then the core bit of this particular portion of the virtual workspace is this handler factory. And this can do whatever you need it to do. So you can, for example, get the logical cluster from the request. You can go list it or get it in this case. And then um, this actually goes through and sets up a reverse proxy that uh, forwards on to KCP itself uh, by doing some impersonation. You could translate here. So you could take an incoming service account and translate it to a denatured API group service account, copy everything over, and uh, you could, I don't know that you would do a reverse proxy, you could maybe, or you could just create a new request and send it on, but you have the full flexibility of implementing your own HTTP handler func to do whatever you need to do uh, in this particular example. So, so um Basic question, again, you know, I'm totally ignorant about this. So um, I need this to work both for um, resources that I know about at development time and resources the, actually, no, I only need to, so I only need to modify resources I know about at development time 
but the client's going to bring all their resources, including ones that are developed by the clients and I never heard of. Yeah, so, so the one piece that we didn't cover, which is critical here, is that all of this, everything that's a virtual workspace, currently is only handled under a path prefix that starts with slash services. So any standard interactions like slash API, V1, service accounts will not go through this path. So that we need to do some more thinking with you for you to turn this more into a proxy that handles slash API V1 and less into something that's an alternate route under slash services. And I don't have a, a great answer for you other than if you go into servers config, uh, I think it's in here. Okay, wait, yes. wait, and now I, I'm surprised because for an API export view, at least, um, right, that's under slash services, but you know, for each individual cluster, uh, let's see, am I getting confused? Um, it's still the case that it looks like a regular API server. That's and I can... true. That's true. As long as you're going through slash services, whatever, as your um, URL, it'll work fine. So yeah, forget what I just said. Okay, so then that brings me back to my question, though. You know, though the to the degree that I'm familiar with Kubernetes and internals, you know, there's this uh, concept of a scheme that has to be told how to uh, marshal and unmarshal every resource. And you know, when we're dealing with things that are user-defined, um, how does this the marshaling and unmarshaling in this proxy uh, actually work? Well, who is connecting to this and what are they doing with it? Let's suppose, for example, that it's Argo CD thinks it's it's putting something, delivering something into a, a Kube cluster. Uh, Mike, you want to unmute? Sorry. Suppose, for example, it is it's Argo CD that thinks that it's delivering stuff into a Kube cluster, user defined stuff. You know, maybe including you know CRDs and custom resources that the user defined that I never heard of. Uh, so you would probably need to set it up to delegate to the API extensions API server for handling that. And you'd also need to be able to handle discovery appropriately. So I don't think this is a super easy problem to solve. It should be solvable. Uh, we can show you how the composition is set up for the main KCP server to be able to handle API v1, all, like all the built-in types like RBAC and whatnot, and how the API extensions API server is wired in as well, and how discovery is handled, whether you're going to uh, you know, some of the built-in uh, types or CRDs. So yeah, I, I don't have immediate answers for the exact shape of this proxy that covers an example like Argo talking to it, but I'm fairly confident we can help you get there. Okay, so let me see if I understand the, the again, the shape of what you're saying. Because uh, in an API export view, for example, you know, the discovery is there, right? If, if I- Only if for the cover. types that are allowed and codified. So if there's a million CRDs in the system, they don't all show up in an API export view. Well, again, remember there's in, in API export view, there's, this, there's the difference between <laughs> clusters slash star versus a particular cluster. Um, no, there isn't, not in an API export view. The API export view only contains the APIs that are exported or contains the schemas for that API export the built-in types that we allow, like namespaces oh, and oh, right. anything that right. claimed that have been accepted. Right. However, the um, code is generic, right? I can API export whatever, as a user of this stuff, I, right? I can API export whatever resources I define. Yes.
but it is specific to an API export is exactly connected to my own resource definitions. Uh, yeah. So let me just make sure, make sure I understand the uh, uh, structure of the problem here. Um, so uh, in an API export view, for example, there is support for discovery, um, and it must be based then on something internal that knows the resources that the export that are being exported. Yeah. So it goes back to the virtual API export controller, and this. API reconciler is what's responsible for returning, uh, or it maintains a set of uh, API domain keys to API definition set. So what's in here ends up being discovery. And um, just to, to recall what we talked about one-on-one, -on -one, Mike, we the API definition set is a bunch of GVRs uh, mapping to a way that you can get storage for them. So uh, if you want to, or if you're using this particular mechanism, the, the API definition set mechanism, this does discovery for you. If you're building your own HTTP handler, you need to handle discovery yourself. And I can point you into like how uh, discovery is merged between uh, you know built-in types and CRDs. I can show you how CRD discovery is done. But unfortunately, th this type of problem is unique enough that uh, it it's going to be probably like thirty percent cobbling together stuff that already exists, and probably seventy percent doing uh, rolling your own. All right. Well, if that's what it is, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, so to be clear, because we want to handle, uh, you know, CRDs from users, we need the left shifted stuff to be able to submit CRDs. The CRDs do not get denatured. They need to go to the underlying server and introduce the resource to the underlying server. And then discovery needs to, and I think, you know, somehow, you know, pass back so that uh, these these user defined resources do get discovered, so that again Argo can deliver not only CRDs but the CRs uh, based on it. Yeah, I, I think kind of what you want to do is write this more like a proxy, like you've been saying. So, uh, but it's kind of like a modified proxy. So, if a client does a discovery request, you grab discovery from the underlying KCP server, and then you augment it with. The, the denatured groups and send that back to the client. And then on incoming CRUD requests, you look at the GVR and if it's um, for one of your specific types that you want to denature, you modify the incoming body and then forward that on. Um, so. Right. I, I understand that. The thing that I'm less familiar with and less clear on is just the underlying stuff that gets assumed, right? Uh, we, you, you, in your outline, you assumed that the the request body can be read, but before we do that, the there has to be a scheme, a local scheme that has the definitions of the resource that's being read. Uh, not necessarily. Like, we'll go look and see how the CR handler works, but like, it doesn't register Go structs with a scheme for every single um crd that's out there to my knowledge that stuff just comes in as unstructured stefan uh, can you add any uh information here i'm not sure i followed the last two minutes to be honest so he my question was just saying uh, um, that if there's a, an arbitrary number of crds out there in the cluster how does the API server scheme deal with incoming CR requests. And I was saying they just come in as unstructured. There's not like. I think so. Yeah. 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 The types aren't registered with the scheme. Yeah. Well, those are two parts to your answer, right? Do I have to register anything at all with the scheme? Uh, and if, if I don't, then that's, that's the simple answer. So, Stefan, are you confirming? I don't think. So, 
so let me ask you clearly, plain simply, you know, to to make this proxy handle, you know, user defined resources, and for all of those, I don't need to do any denaturing because they're already denatured. I just want to pass them through, but I do need the code, you know, to be able to read them. So if I if the proxy does not register anything in the scheme for the user defined resources, are they going to get successfully read? It's okay with me if they're delivered in the code is unstructured. That's fine. I just need to get the delivery to something that, that I can then pass on. I think that this is probably something that's best done as an exploration. Like, there's only so much you can plan in advance. Like, I would probably create a new, create the scaffolding for a new virtual workspace and start to code it the way that makes sense and see what happens and then react based on how many times it fails. All right. And we're out of time here. So uh, that's yeah. a great place to stop. All right. Thank you, Andy and Stefan. All right. I'll post the recording once it's available. And um, I won't see you all next week. And like I said, I, I don't know how this is going to continue going forward. But please, yeah, for them, I take think the big over. outstanding questions are for MJ and um, I guess he dropped already, uh, Christoph. Um, yeah. You know what? What their teams can muster in terms of manpower, and we need to compare that with the work that would be involved, as well as my team. So, yeah. Sounds good. All right. Good to see you all. Uh, Thank take you. care.